service so far guys yes. come on it's uh it's pretty awesome to be with you all today yes. and i know some of you guys were losing faith when you felt a bit of drizzle over there guys okay don't worry about that we serve a god who controls the weather we're gonna have church service today guys amen you know guys honestly you know we we, we live in a time where the world has been shaped by different statements we live in a time where people's mindsets have been changed by statements we live in a time where man's statements have changed even man's purposes. Woo! You ask why these statements? I call them proclamations. Oh, okay. You know, in the UK, you have what is called the royal proclamations. Okay. You know, th these are matters that the king or the queen wants to publicly announce to a subject. And in a sense, what makes a, a proclamation, in a sense, you know, legal and binding is they have something called a great seal. Okay, it's, it's, it's this wax kind of thing, and you put a stamp on it, and it says, this is what makes it official. Yeah. Without it, it's not official. Right. And in the USA, you have George Washington. He had a, a, a proclamation called, you know, the Proclamation of Neutrality. He gave one in 1793, and he said this kind of proclamation is, you know, no American citizen can help out in, in the war against Great Britain and France. Come on. He didn't want any war. I'm reminded of Abraham Link's, uh, Lincoln's uh, um, proclamation. It is called the Emancipation Proclamation right there. He gave this in 22nd of September in 1862. It says this, that on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be rebellion against the United States, shall be then thenceforward and forever free. Amen. And the executive government of the United States, including the military uh, and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons. And will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them. In any efforts, they may make, the, uh, they may make for their actual freedom. Wow. You know, I, I love this because Abraham Lincoln believed in the freedom of slavery. Amen. He believed in it. And to some extent, when, you, when you, uh, you ask yourself, okay, how much did he believe in it? He believed in it so much that he says, I'm going to proclaim it. That's how much I believe in it. Wow. You know, when you study out Abraham Lincoln, to some extent, you know, they do say that he was a man of faith. And I believe the reason why he had this deep desire in his heart to, to in a sense, free, free slaves is because he kind of had that godly influence in his life. Although, of course, you have people, you know, Abraham Lincoln wanted to free slaves, but I, I want to persuade you today about a, a proclamation that even makes more sense. Mm. A proclamation that affects all genders, on, all races, all age groups. You ask yourself what kind of proclamation that is. That is the Salvation Proclamation. Yeah. That's the title of my lesson today. The Salvation Proclamation. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. It says in Second Peter. Come on, Peter. Come on, Peter. Let me get a bit closer right there. Chapter 3. Actually, I might move a little bit closer right there. Sorry, Steph. I want to be close to the church. Come on. Come on, Mom. Yeah, we love you too. <laughs> It says in 2 Peter 3, verse 8. 
much. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. You know, this says, you know, when you're praying and God answers your prayer and He says tomorrow, He's basically saying you're going to get an answer in 2020 right there. <laughs> That's what the Bible's saying, guys. I don't know about you guys, but it's what it says over here. It says in verse 9, <laughs> The Lord is not slow in keeping His promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And the church says, Amen. You know, this is quite interesting. We, we learn something about the nature of God over here. It teaches that God is a timeless God. You know, when God says, I am, he basically says, I am the past, I am the present, I am the future, I am time. I'm not limited to any time. So when you say, hey, God, you're being slow, God's like, I'm not slow, I am on time, not on your time. (laughs) And it's kind of crazy, like, man, and and, and in this timeless nature, he says he's patient. There we say that the, the patience of God is out of this world. No, yeah, come on, bro. Yes. <laughs> you understand something over here, guys. There was, there was an issue in the church in 2 Peter. When you read uh, from the beginning, it talked about, you know, disciples who, uh, you know, kind of like this weird group of disciples who said, look, guys, when is Jesus Christ coming back? So they said, this guy, Jesus is not coming back. So therefore, what's the point of becoming a disciple? What's the point of becoming a disciple early? We might as well go sit it up and become disciples later on. That's what they were teaching. They were saying he's not coming back. And a lot of people say, why why does God allow so much evil in the world? I'll tell you why. Why does he allow everything to happen in the world? I'll tell you why. Why hasn't Jesus Christ come back? I'll tell you why. It says he wants everyone to repent. That's why. He is so patient. He's just waiting. He's like, look, I could end the world, but I don't want to. I want people to repent. That's why I'm allowing all the evil in the world to take place. That's why Jesus Christ hasn't come back yet. So if you're alive today, God is saying he wants you to repent. But let's carry on. Let's see why it's important to repent, okay? Verse 10, it says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. You know, they say the age of accountability is around age 12. You know, I sincerely believe mine was about uh, age five or six. (laughs) (laughs) You know, as uh, as most kids around six years old, you know, what they'll be doing with their time, you know, they'll be watching cartoons, they'll be playing video games, they'll be playing with their toys. No, I was at the corner shop stealing chocolate. That's what I was doing at six years old. (laughs) I was an evil child. I knew I was lost from six years old. I knew I needed to get baptized. I knew it. I knew it from early. I was like, man, I'm going to hell. And it it was kind of interesting because I I would would go to this corner shop and I I wouldn't just steal once, guys. I stole for a whole month. A whole month. Oh Frank, is that you? And you know, it's kind of crazy because my friends, you know, they'll be like, where, where's this guy getting all this money from? You know, and I used to go to my friends, I'm like, yo, you want some chocolate? You want some chocolate? I, I got you, bro. I got, I got some chocolate for you. And I'd go to the corner shop, I'd get some chocolate, and I was so good at it. It was crazy. Yes, bro. Yeah. And it's kind of crazy because I'm like, wow, why did this guy catch me out? Why, why, why didn't he notice? For like 30 days, I'm just out there stealing some chocolate, right? And eventually one day, I remember the day when I got caught. You know, um, the, 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 the worker was following me around, right? You know, he was following me around. I'm like, why is this guy following me, right? You know, but anyway, I risked it and he caught me out. He caught me out. And, you know, I, I wonder, I'm like, how, how did they find out? I'm pretty sure the owner was like, man, there's stuff missing. What's going on over here? And he probably blamed on, on the staff right there. And he was trying to look around who to see what's happening. And, you know, and, and I think about how the, the owner didn't notice I was a thief. He was like, man, this guy's innocent. I didn't know that he didn't prepare for it. And he says over here that Jesus Christ is going to come like a thief. You don't prepare for a thief. No. Right? You don't know if a thief's going to come or not. No, right? He just comes out of nowhere. And when you study out the scriptures, it says, of course, in Matthew 24, Jesus says that the day he comes is going to be like the days of Noah, 
where everyone's having a great time. Everyone is, uh, you know, drinking, getting married, all doing all this kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden, hey guys, where's Noah? He's on the boat. Hey. <laughs> Noah's missing. <laughs> Noah preaching. Yeah. And that, that's how it's going to be like. You're just having a good time. All of a sudden, you're like, wait a minute, where's this person? They're gone because Jesus Christ has come back. Yeah. You better make sure you're on the boat yeah. with Jesus. So I want to let you know, guys, today, it, it, the fact that Jesus Christ has not come back, he just wants you to repent. Amen? Amen. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. On, Colossians chapter 1. <laughs> Colossians chapter 1. Yep. The salvation proclamation. Colossians 1, we read in verse 28. It says, say amen if you guys are there. Amen. It says, he is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully, fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. You know, Paul over here says, we have to proclaim something. And he says, over here, we proclaim Christ. This brings me to my first point. Point number one is proclaim his name. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Proclaim his name. You know, we're still studying out the book of Acts. You know, last week, of course, we studied out Acts chapters 1 to 3. And uh, I don't know who still remembers the title from last week right there. Yeah, oh, wait. Oh, it's about time. Oh, okay, there we go. All right, all right. Alex and Gujo, Alex and Gujo isn't even really part of the church right there, but he comes on Sundays, and he knows the, the service right there, guys. Okay, it's about time. And uh, we, we, we looked at how in the first point that it was, it's about time we grow. And we looked at how, in a sense, you know, uh, that we know we shouldn't just stay in Jerusalem and Judea, which is uh, our own kind of people right there. You know, he says, don't, don't, don't just baptize people who like jollof rice like you. Don't just baptize people who like to do the shaku like you. Don't baptize people who like Afro beads like you. No, no, you got to go to the ends of the earth. Come on, bro. He says, you got to go to Samaria. Yeah. Samaria is the place that you don't want to go to. Yeah. The places in Birmingham that, that, you know, you're like, I don't want to be there. I don't want to go there. Places like... Hensworth right there. Oh. <laughs> places like Hensworth. Places, places like, like, like Northfield. Samaria, we, we got to go to those places, guys. The place that people don't want to go to. <laughs> And, it, and of course, we looked at as well, the second point was, uh, it's about time you hear the truth. Yeah. And we saw, of course, you know, uh, that the truth in a sense sets us free and that the only way we can truly be saved is being baptized as a disciple. Yeah, and hopefully today's lesson will, in a sense, um, either reiterate that or uh, help you understand salvation in a deeper essence, a deeper meaning right there, amen? Yeah. In Acts chapter 4, you guys are there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, bro. Yeah. It says in verse 1, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came out to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. You know, of course, you come across uh, a group of religious guys over here called the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees, you yeah, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Pharisees believed in resurrection and the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection and that's why they were sad, you see? Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> it says, <laughs> that's why they were sad right there. <laughs> But, 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 let's carry on. The Sadducees, right? You know, they said that they can't resurrect. But it says in verse 4, <laughs> But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Wow. I love this scripture. Wow. This says that Peter and John, they proclaimed the name of Jesus. They were so effective that they had 5,000 men join them. Wow. Initially 2,000 because they had 3,000 and then 2,000 in total, 5,000. 
You know, imagine 1,000, uh, 2,000 additions, guys. That will be incredible. Wow. Imagine a thousand teenagers in the church. Oh my God. Oh. That would be the most emotional movement, the emotional church in the movement of God. They'd be everywhere. Super emotional. <laughs> Imagine a thousand single brothers right there. Oh. That, that, that is a thousand options for the sisters. <laughs> Three thousand. <laughs> Bro. It's kind of crazy right there. <laughs> but but it says something over here, guys. Let's carry on reading. 5,000 editions. That's awesome. It says, verse 5, The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there. And so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others uh, of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? This is powerful. What happens over here is they have so much opposition. The apostles have opposition from the rulers, elders, teachers of the law, and as the high priest, uh, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other high priest family. That's a lot of opposition. And it says over here, they were told, they said, by what power, right? Or what name did you do this? This is quite, this is interesting. You understand something over here. In Hebrew culture, names were very significant. Names were not just the name of an individual. No, names were in a sense, they symbolized someone's character. So you know, when you look at the Bible, you read 1 Samuel, for example, you have this uh, child who gets born called Ichabod. Okay, some of you guys know Ichabod, right? And Ichabod means the glory departed. So what, what, what the Hebrews would do is they were very specific with the names they'd give. They would give names based on the situation. They'd give names based on, you know, a prophecy. They'd give names based on the faith that they have. Uh, they'd give names based on what they think the child's going to be and so forth. So names had characters attached to it. So when they say about what power, what name, they were saying, look, there's, there's, there's power in the name of Jesus. Wow. Because what, when you preach the name of Jesus, you're not preaching a name, you're preaching a character change. Wow. People have no choice but to change their character and to be like Jesus Christ. It's quite powerful. Names have power. Verse 8, let's carry on. Then Peter, be with the Holy Spirit, say to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we have been called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he is healed, then know this, you and all people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you build is rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And the church says, Amen. that's the name that saves you. There's no other name that can save you. You know, they, this is what they proclaimed. This was the proclamation that God gave in heaven. He sealed it with the death of Christ. He said the only name that anyone in this world can be saved by is Jesus Christ's name. That means Buddha can't save you. That means Confucius can't save you. That means Muhammad's name can't save you. Only the name of Jesus can save you. Now you're going to stand how deep these men understand this this message let's go to galatians chapter one galatians chapter one i hope you guys are still with me galatians chapter one the point is simply proclaim his name because you got to ask yourself you know whose name are you following and can that name save you Galatians 1 verse 6, it says, this is Paul, who's written this basically in 57 AD, right? He was in Corinth at the time. Verse 6, it says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Yeah. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, apostles, or an angel... Gabriel, Michael, from heaven, should preach a gospel other than one we preach to you? Let them be under God's curse. As we've already said, so now I say again, 
if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than the one you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Preach. These men believe the message so much. They believe that this name saves you so much that they said, look guys, I, if I came, I planned the church and I saved you with that name and I come back two years later and I say, hey guys, that name doesn't save you. Don't listen to me. Preach. That's what he says. If an angel, Gabriel, comes to you, gives you a different message from what we just saw over there, X412, which says salvation is for no one else, don't listen to him. Nice. <laughs> it's interesting because when you study out the scriptures, when you read Colossians 1, 23, which was roughly around 62 AD, it says that uh, the gospel has been bearing fruit all around the world. That means around 73, 67 AD, the whole world knew about the name of Jesus. They knew that the only name that can save you is Jesus Christ. So then what comes around 600 AD? Muhammad goes to a cave. He sees the angel Gabriel. He gives him the message. He gives him a new name. He says, that name is what's going to save you. No. Paul says, that, that's baloney. Paul says, that's false teaching. Paul says, that name is not going to save you. The Bible is crystal clear on what name saves you. And I like how the Bible says it wasn't his surname that saves you. Right, his last name. It wasn't his middle name that saves you. It was just his name. <laughs> now, in, in, in Hebrew culture, again, you understand that they never had last names, actually. They only had first names. So what they would do is they will call someone based on his family lineage. So they say Jesus, the son of Joseph. That's how they identified everyone. So Jesus Christ is not his full name. Christ just means Messiah or anointed one. So Christ is not his last name. His name is just Jesus. He's like, guys, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not leaving room for any ambiguity. Don't think my middle name will save you. My last name will save you. No, it's just my name. <laughs> That's the only thing that will save you. Come on, bro. Let's, go, bro. Let's go back to Acts chapter 4. Come on, bro. Proclaim his name. Proclaim his name. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that this man had passed the first principles. I hope you guys passed the first principles tonight, guys. Amen. It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that this man had done ICCM. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that a scripture on the Instagram bio. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized they typed amen on that post on Facebook. <laughs> No, that's not what it says. It doesn't say that. It says they saw they were unschooled, ordinary men. I like that. You know, the, the, the Greek word over here for unschooled, ordinary men is actually agramatos. It means men who are illiterate. More specifically, men who are not schooled in uh, the Jewish culture or the Jewish understanding of, you know, uh, basically, basically the Jews had schools. <laughs> so these guys never went to the schools. They said they were unschooled men. These guys, they weren't familiar with the first principles, let me say. But what did, it, what, what did they notice? It says they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. I like that. You know, I believe, of course, earlier on, Daniel was trying to say this in his prayer. And that's what they noticed. They didn't notice their intellect. They noticed their walk with God. Yeah. They noticed their lifestyle. This says that you can know the whole Bible. Yeah. And you won't have an influence because your, your life doesn't match it, basically. Yeah. This could say, look, I've read the Bible. That's great. But did you try it out? Did you apply it into your life? Yeah. 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 This can say you know about the Bible, but have you actually lived it out? There it is. That's what really matters. Living out the Word of God. Put into practice. And I personally believe the reason why probably you're struggling with your faith is because you're just not putting the Word of God into practice. Amen. You're not putting the Word of God into practice. 
But we see over here, they were unschooled, unschooled ordinary men, which is quite encouraging. It says in verse 14, but since they could not see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then confer together. What are we going to do with these men? They ask. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Wow. There it is again, an attack on the name of Jesus. It says, verse 18, then they call them in again and, and command them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. There it is again, the name. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speak about what we have seen and heard and the church says. Yeah. You know, I, I, I love how multiple times they keep going after the name of Jesus. Multiple times. Stop preaching the name. Stop preaching the name. Stop preaching the name. They understood the power of proclaiming the name of Jesus. Let's see what happens in verse 17, the same chapter, okay? Sorry, read from verse 27, actually. It says, Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servant to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus Christ. After they had prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they, all filled the Holy, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. You know, what I love over here is that the apostles had boldness, but they asked for more boldness. Amen. Come on. They were really bold, but they knew that this task at hand to continue proclaiming this name that's being attacked, they needed a greater boldness, and they prayed. You know, what I like over here is, you know, this week, for men's night out, you know, I told the man, I said, hey man, on Wednesday, we're going out. Like, okay, cool, let's go, let's go out. But no, 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 we're not, we're not just going out, guys. We're doing some street preaching. Wow. And they're like, oh, wait, what, what do you mean, Frank? Are we gonna like stand in the street and preach? Yeah, that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna stand in the street, shout, proclaim the name of Jesus. And I, I, I'll be honest, there was, there was a bit of grumbling from a few brothers. Oh, there was a bit of, I, I don't know if this is for us, bro. I, I don't know what people say, bro. Oh. And, and I'm, I'm not going to say any names, but you know, I'm like, Daniel, don't worry about it, bro. Don't worry about it, bro. We're going to proclaim the name of Jesus. And you know, I won't lie to you guys. Honestly, street preaching is kind of scary. It's scary. It's hard. You gotta be bold. People look at you, they judge you. They don't care about what you wear anymore because now they can hear your message. They're like, oh, that, that's the Christian. So I won't lie, I was a bit afraid too. But what's interesting about boldness is that boldness isn't being afraid, guys, okay? It's, it's you do something in spite of being fearful. That's what boldness is. It's like, you know what? I'm afraid, but I'm still gonna do it. Come on, bro. And we did it. You know, we went out there, we sang. You know, we had Joseph lay the word, the word of God out right there. He was God level open by his sins. People were passing by, convicted. I preached the word of God. My, my title was simply called, You're Replaceable. Yes. You're Replaceable. I preached on Acts chapter 1, how Judas was so out of touch with the scriptures that he didn't know that scriptures were talking about him falling away. Jeez. Oh my. So out of touch with the word of God. He didn't, he didn't think, man, this could be talking about me. No, <laughs> so out of touch. He thought he was irreplaceable. Come on. But what happens in Acts 1, he, he, he falls away, of course, right? He kills himself. And it says, let us replace him. Oh, no. Yep. This says, guys, you're going to be replaced. <laughs> you can be replaced, rather. Yeah, that's right. You study out the scriptures in 1 Samuel 15, where, you know, uh, Saul... You know, uh, of course, he, he, he sins against God, and you know, Samuel's crying. God comes to Samuel and says, hey, why are you crying over Saul? Like, I've anointed David, move on. Yeah. <laughs> I've replaced him with someone else. He's like, why are you crying over fall aways, guys? I'm replacing them. Don't worry about that. I'm gonna replace them with someone better. God can replace you. 
and I gave the charge, guys, be irreplaceable, okay? Yeah. Be irreplaceable. That's right. We went out, we preached the word of God. It was awesome. Man. Every man was fired up afterwards. Oh, you know, there is a correlation between proclaiming his name and being bold. <laughs> In order to proclaim the name of Jesus, you, you have to be bold. You have to be bold. You know, I, I love reading Steph's uh, Facebook comments, you know, uh, posts rather. She just shares about her life. She's like, hey, this is what I used to do. You know, guys, look, look, look. I, I used to be an influential person, LGBT, but now I'm in this movement of God. Come and study the Bible. Wow. She's just out there laying it on out. Oh, and I'm pretty sure there's others out there I'm not noticing, but God notices, okay? Yeah. On, but guys, I challenge you, be bold. That's the challenge I have for you. Be bold this week. Not next week. Not next month, this week. Proclaim his name. You know, what, what is being bold? Think about the thing that you're afraid of doing the most. For Christ, okay? Not like in real life. <laughs> we don't care about bungee jumping. I don't care about that, okay? I'm talking about for Christ, <laughs> okay? Not bungee jumping and stuff like that. Just for Christ. What is being bold? Being bold is door knocking. That's being bold. Don't knock it. Don't knock it, yeah. Knock on people's doors, say, hey, I want to stay the Bible with you. <laughs> Do people in your neighborhood know that you know, you're a follower of Christ? Do people in your building know that, hey, I can go to this flat over here and get saved? Do they know that? What, is, what else is being bold? Staying the Bible with your family. Yeah. That's being bold. Telling your family that they're not saved? That's boldness. You know, we all know something we're afraid to do. Every single one of us, it is, you know, we all have some fear, Amen. right? Because we're human. And I, I encourage you this week, guys, be bold. <laughs> Proclaim his name, be bold. Go for it. Don't be afraid. Do some door knocking, post that, do that Instagram post, whatever it is that you feel like, you know what, I'm afraid to do. But we have to proclaim his name, guys. Because there's no other name which we must be saved. Amen? Amen. Point number two, don't complain, just proclaim. <laughs> don't complain just proclaim right. you know guys have you ever complained as a Christian yes. Yes. Never. Never. right okay so we got a few complainers and a couple of liars amen <laughs> you know there, there was those once uh, this guy who who was a monk right and it, it was it was kind of like a, a street you know uh, a place to be right there and you know they, they, they vowed to not speak for 10 years Right, kind of challenging right there. So they made a vow. Look, I'm not going to speak for 10 years. And what happens is, you know, after 10 years, you're allowed to say two words. Okay? Only two words in his monastery. Okay? Two words. So this one monk goes to the head monk after 10 years. He says, hey, 10 years have passed. What are your two words? The one monk says, bed hard, said the monk. The head monk says, I see. 10 years later, he comes back and says, hey, okay, it's 10 years, what are my two words? He says, food stinks, oh. said the monk. <laughs> the head monk said, I see. <laughs> Yet another 10 years passed, and you know, the head monk says, hey, what are your two words? The monk says, I quit. Oh. <laughs> the head monk says, well, I can see why, replied the head monk. All you ever do is complain. Oh. Oh. Yep. You know, don't, don't, don't let your complaining as a disciple lead you to quitting. Because that's, that's what can happen. The more you complain, the closer you are to quitting. Oh. Acts chapter 5. All right. We're going to read from verse 17. The verse is from 1 to 17. It's just Ananias and Sapphira cheating on the contribution. Oh. So you can read that for your own convictions right there. Yeah to give online it says in verse 17 then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy they arrested the apostles and put them in public jail but during the night an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out go stand in the temple courts he said and tell the people all about this new life Woo! there's a new life guys yep. there's a new life you know, if you're visiting today, I want to let you know there's a new life. Yes. There's a new life. Mm -hmm. That you don't need to be drunk to be happy. Yes. You don't need to be high on weed to, to be happy. Yes. You can be high on the Holy Spirit right here. Yes. You don't need any of that. There's a new life. 
<laughs> you know, I, I encourage you, if you're sick of your life right now, I want to let you know that there's a new life for you. Yeah. God has a new life for you. You can study the Bible today with the person who's invited you and learn about this new life. There's a new life, guys. Come on, bro. It says over here in verse 25. It says, then someone came and said, look, the man you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name. There it is again, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with the teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. You know, this says this is just two people you serve, God or human beings. A lot of people say, you know what, I don't, be, I don't want to be a Christian because I don't want to be constrained to God, you know, controlling me. Well, it's either God controls you or the world controls you. We are all under control. It's either God or the Queen of England, okay? That's it. You got to pick. You know, who, who are you obeying today? Who are you going to leave this service obeying? God or man? Verse 30 says, The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin in order that the man be put aside, outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to this man. Some time ago, Theodos appeared, came in to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied with him. He was killed. All his followers were dispersed, and all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave this man alone, let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop this man. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Wow. Nice. You know, so many times people have tried to stop movements. Yeah. And it, it has resulted to nothing. So many have tried, and it's either ended or the people have scattered. You got, you got two guys over here, Judas and Theodos. They're leaders. They stop movements. People follow them. But the moment they die, the vision is killed as well. Right. The people start following. And what I love is that with Jesus' vision, it's different. He had a vision to get 12 men. From 12 men, 70 men. 70 men, 120. 120, 3,120. And to the ends of the earth. And even after he died, it's still going on right now. Why? Because in the kingdom of God, we have contenders, not pretenders. Right. These people's movements died because they were pretenders. They were just pretending to follow Christ. They were pretending, sorry, to follow these individuals. But if we really want to be a movement that's separate from everyone else, we've got to contend. Contend means to fight. Fight for the faith. Proclaim His name. Preach. And this is what makes God's movement different from every other movement out there. Amen. That when, when the visionary was killed, the vision still lives on. Nice. In verse 20 he says his speech persuaded them they called the apostles in and had them flogged then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go okay I got a question for you who's ever been to jail over here for being a Christian okay who's been flogged for being a Christian alright okay no one right okay we have it easy. <laughs> we have it dead easy. These men were put in jail. These men were flogged. They had every right to complain about their hardships. Every right in the world to complain about their hardships. But let's see what the Bible says, okay? 41. The apostles left the Sanhedrin depressed and bitter because they had been counted worthy, right? Oh, no. I don't know what translation that is. 
That's, that's different. <laughs> the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. The name, there it is. The name. Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. You know, what kills the movement isn't persecution, but laziness. Yeah. Preach. 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 Persecution never stopped the kingdom of God from growing. It actually caused it to grow. That's right. What kills any movement is just laziness. <laughs> laziness and people complaining. Yeah. And these guys over here, they never complained. But rather, they kept on proclaiming the name of Jesus. You know, guys, I want to encourage you to today that you don't allow the hardships in your life to cause you to complain. We have it super easy. You know, I love Joseph's community. It was so powerful. Just the hardships she was facing, praying every day, just for God to take it away, this thorn in the flesh. But she's like, you know what? I'm not going to complain. I'm going to proclaim the name of Jesus. In closing, I give you just simply three challenges. The first one is be bold this week. Be bold. You know how to be bold. The second one is simply stop complaining. Stop complaining. And the guess is simply learn and study about this new life. The new life that Christ has for you. The salvation proclamation is this. Be bold. Be beautiful and bring the good news to the lost. Proclaim his name in the streets, in your homes, in your workplace, in the gym, in your schools. Do not be silenced. Do not speak of any name besides the name of Jesus. Don't complain of hardships. Don't quit. Proclaim his name. That is the salvation proclamation and to God be all the glory.